This is Emily Blackshire with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at the OSU Library. Today is Tuesday, December 17th, 2019, and I'm interviewing Colin Pope for the Deep Roots Oklahoma Authors Oral History Project. Colin, you're an award-winning poet and recently published your debut poetry collection, Why Did It Go to Your Funeral, in 2019. Your poetry addresses loss and grief and resonates with many people. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Yeah, of course. Where were you born and where did you grow up? Um, I was born in Saranac Lake, New York, and grew up there. Um, Saranac Lake's about uh, an hour and a half from the Canadian border mm-hmm. on the top side of New York State. So very cold and very remote. It's in the middle of the Adirondack Mountains, which is like the largest state protected park or something in the country. So, like, the nearest city was Plattsburgh. Mm-hmm. And that was about 50,000 people, and that's an hour away. So the nearest airport, I didn't take an airplane ride until I was in my late 20s. So very remote. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very remote. So what did you do for, for fun there? What, what did you like? Where did you like to go I mean, hang out? What did you do in this remote? That place? is an interesting question. Okay. Uh-huh. To be perfectly frank, there's not a lot to do up there. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was a kid, you know, you go skiing and stuff. Um, sledding and all that, all the kind of like Norman Rockwellish Americana stuff. Yeah. Um, but then when you get to be in like middle school, high school, people get lost to drink and drugs up there pretty easily. Not unlike a lot of places in Oklahoma. Um, and I did a lot of that. And luckily got kind of hooked up with a crew of semi-intellectual people in high school Mm -hmm. so like i would be doing that and then i'd be in like the basketball team and then also we would like hang out at the library for three or four hours after Mm -hmm. school like that kind of thing so kind of a mixed bag uh, of of things to do but yeah you can't you know you can't really drive anywhere because it's so remote and the the roads are so icy Mm -hmm. um especially in the winters the winters last like six months so um Yeah, I I mean, I started drinking when I was very young and not like a lot, but you just couldn't, there's not much to do, you Mm -hmm. know, and it's just what people do in those places. Did you go to Canada? Mm -hmm. When I was 18, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, That was actually the thing to do before Mm pre-9-11. The the check to get across the border was just a guy who was kind of half asleep in a booth. Uh And it was like, oh, okay, you guys are coming up. Uh, We were all 18 years old and they, they knew why we were going up there. Um, and so we'd go up there for like a night yeah. and I'd drive back at like 2 a.m. Um, Semi sober. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and there's always there's clubs right across the border of Canada to like play to those people. So but yeah, after 9-11, you needed like a passport and a special license and stuff. So. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Like when I was. That changed. Oh, things yeah. A lot. Yeah. When I was a kid, it was just you have a license or whatever. Go ahead, you're fine. And they rarely ever stop to check anything. Were you living up there when 9-11 happened? Uh, when 9-11 happened, I was in college. Okay. Um, so in, in New York State. Mm-hmm. And, um, I went to college at SUNY Geneseo. Okay. Um, which is kind of um, near Rochester, just south of Rochester in the western portion of the state. Yeah, there's some students at that school whose parents were actually in the buildings, so... Mm-hmm. It was close enough to New York City that we were affected, but not so close that we could, like, witness it or anything, you know? Right. <laughs> so what were your favorite subjects in high school or when you were younger? What did, what did you do with your with your intellectual crowd really, at the library? <laughs> <laughs> um, we would just goof around and talk about, like, ideas. And yeah. we were all, like, uh, you know, I did drama and stuff in mm-hmm. high school when I was in men's ensemble and chorus, of course. And... Mm-hmm. Stuff like that. Favorite subject. Now, when I was a kid, I really liked math Mm -hmm. and science, as a lot of boys do. Mm -hmm. But then during, I'm thinking of like third, fourth, fifth grade and all that too. Then during our snack breaks, I remember somehow I got a hold of an old like first edition of Dungeons and Dragons, like the manual and all this dice and stuff. I got them like yeah. a yard sale or something. And so I started doing that and I recruited like a bunch of like third and fourth grade people. So during our 15 minute snack break, we would just like play Dungeons and Dragons for a few minutes, mm-hmm. which was kind of nice and like a creative break. 
I was fortunate that for a brief period up there, they started an uh, academically talented program, mm -hmm. you know, for like younger kids. They discontinued it after, like I was in it for two years and then they stopped doing it altogether. So like there's two years I were in it with the only two years they had it. And what was nice about that is we weren't, we didn't, the class wasn't structured the way that other classes were. So we were very free form. Like there would be um, uh, a, a nook in the corner of the room that just had a whole bunch of junk. And if you had an idea of what you wanted to invent or make, you were welcome to go do that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. which was very cool. So like the creativity was encouraged, but always, even back then, like it really got, I was really into math and science a lot back then. And like, you know, I was a kid though, so I played video games all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, I wasn't really into reading and writing that mm -hmm. much mm -hmm. until later. A little bit later, yeah. yeah. How big was your high school or your, your other school? Was uh, it a small So, class? yeah, my high school graduating class was, I think like 115. Oh, okay. Um, so, and it was a magnets, not magnets, that's a wrong way to say that. Saranac Lake uh, High School. But there's a lot of little towns mm -hmm. around that just, we would bust people in from like, on the outskirts, little yeah. towns that nobody's ever heard of, like Anchota, New York, and uh, uh, you know, little play people that just live like in Raybrook, get mm -hmm. bust in. Yeah, it wasn't a big school. Yeah, and incredibly homogenous, like white, mm -hmm. very white. Yeah. So you mentioned being interested in, in drama and um, singing men's ensemble, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So what's your earliest memory of, of creating something, whether it's writing or, or you like a lot of little kids who make up their own plays or stories so, or do you write things down? I think it was journal? that. Yeah. yeah. I didn't journal. Uh -huh. Um, Every once in a while, I would, you know, write a little thing or something. Like, I, I used to like to play, experiment with poetry when I was in, like, middle school, but mm -hmm. and a little bit in grade school, but it was never anything serious. I'm trying to think. Like, the, the, maybe the most formative was there was this traveling troupe of dancers and, like, mm -hmm. actors um, who I don't even remember how my mom knew them. And somehow I got involved with them when I was like very little, maybe six or seven years old. And I was part of an interpretive dance number. <laughs> and this is, I'm talking, yeah, very, I was very young. Um, where I'm pretty sure I had to dress up like a, a bunny or something. Um, and it was, a, I guess it was a little mystical to me. It, the reason it was formative, it was a little mystical to me because I didn't understand that people actually lived that way. Like you get mm -hmm. to see the, the backstage stuff, right? Like right. you get to like be backstage and people are like giving you cues and stuff mm -hmm. and you're like, okay. And so like, and that happened when I was very little. So throughout uh, middle school and high school, I did a lot of like, I did community theater, mm -hmm. um, like musicals and stuff like that. And then in high school, I started acting again, I think in like my junior year and I was in drama for like the next you know, until school let out, essentially doing musicals and doing um, plays and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's something about that interpretive dance. I don't know. It was very strange. Um, like I didn't know what I was doing or even yeah. that, I, that I was acting. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, like I was so does. little that it, they were just yeah. like, put on this costume, just do this. And I was like, okay. Yeah. Children uh, are so good at that. <laughs> at, just, at, at, at play and mm -hmm. just not asking questions yeah and it was I'm going with it it was easy not to be nervous because it was like these other these older people that had this troop were just like yeah don't you know just this is what we're going to do we're going to play around in front of them and that'll be it and, and i was like okay uh yeah that was it i can't remember you know when you're i did all the other little stuff too i'm sure like mm -hmm. me and my sister would talk into tape recorders yeah you know? <laughs> like record our own little shows and stuff uh -huh. and just to do stuff like that a lot yeah. Was your mom interested in, in theater? Did she like to sing and or play music? Or she like did. Um, like that? She wasn't incredibly musical, but she was interested in theater. And she always encouraged mm -hmm. me and my sister to be involved in stuff. I mean, we were a, a, in a poor town. We were a poor family. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that 
she understood that there was virtue in getting us to the library frequently and getting us to like involved in plays. Um, she signed us up for um, these like summer, I don't know what they're called anymore. I wish I could remember the name of them. It would just be like these summer programs, that mm-hmm. almost day camps for kids. Yeah. Um, that usually would culminate with a performance of some kind. Mm-hmm. So like, I remember we did like a Peanuts thing and I always played Snoopy. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I had like a Snoopy costume and stuff yeah. with like ears hanging down. It was great. Um, yeah, she was very supportive of that. And I think, but she herself wasn't really, wasn't really doing that much of that kind of stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. My mom is more of a, she worked at the college for many years. She worked at the community college up there for many years. Okay. Um, and she was, uh, she moved away, worked away up from like, you know, administrative assistant to like kind of executive administrative assistant to like registrar of the college. Oh, wow. So she was like yeah. fourth in command of the college. Mm-hmm. Um, she worked there for 30 years, yeah, before they eventually laid her off mm-hmm. under some flimsy pretense. Yeah. But yeah, she was more into, you know, she was very committed to like uh, earning enough money to support us, especially after my dad left. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is your sister, younger sister, older sister, only other sibling? Uh, she's my only sibling, and mm-hmm. she's three years older. Three years older. Yep. She looks almost nothing like me. <laughs> Long red hair, very mm-hmm. fair skin. What did you all like to do together when you were kids? Did you go to the library together or I mean, you're kind of close enough in age to not yeah, we were, really we were, want to hang out? <laughs> that was a big part. I mean, I remember when we were little kids, you know, we would go play and stuff together a little. And we had cousins that lived near us, so we'd play with them. But we didn't, once I got to be in like middle school, she wanted nothing to do with me. <laughs> like I was just, and I was kind of nerdy too, you know, mm-hmm. big plastic frame glasses and like, uh, no fashion sense and that sort of thing. And she was just like, I don't want to deal with you, <laughs> um, which was fair. Yeah, didn't, didn't, didn't claim you. Yeah. <laughs> so what did you dream about becoming when you were a child? What did you envision that you wanted to do with your life? It could be anything. Like, did you want to uh, be an archaeologist? Like, <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, like, Jones, you know, that kind of there was like or, all that stuff. Yeah. There was like the standard stuff. I think the first thing I seriously thought about doing was being a chef. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Um, and my mom always discouraged me away from it. She was like, you're always going to work holidays and you pretty much never get time off. And it's a very difficult lifestyle. And I was like, yeah, you know. And then I did, I was a chef for a little while. Mm-hmm. And she was right. It sucked. Um, <laughs> so you became a poet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I do remember, like, I wanted to be, a, like, a police detective for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, but didn't want to be a policeman. So it didn't really work out. You know, mm-hmm. that's not how it works. I, I talked to a guy. I remember being in, like, ninth or tenth grade. I talked to a guy from, like, the military about being in the military. That was not ever going to happen for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was a little kid. I mean, I don't remember. It's weird. I would do things like I'm very solitary growing up. So like, mm-hmm. um, cause my mom, after my parents divorced, my dad was gone. Our mom was at work all the time. And my sister didn't want anything to do with me. So I was just home alone. So I would do things like, you know, pretend to chase leprechauns in the backyard or like, <laughs> yeah. or like see a Rambo. Yeah. <laughs> I always be like, I almost got, got, that, got that elf on the <laughs> shelf. <laughs> like see a Rambo and try to like find the end of it and kind of stand there and be like, Oh, is this it? To try to find a pot of gold or something. Um, yeah, I didn't really have any aspirations towards like a career. Mm-hmm. What did you major in uh, in college? Oh, uh, so when I got there, the idea was that I was supposed to be a lawyer. Um, my mom had encouraged me toward that since sometime in middle school because I was good at debate. Mm-hmm. Um, I got there and I was political science. Which you're not you're not supposed to be political science if you want to be a lawyer, but that's what I did. Um, and then I hated that, so I quickly switched to history, which was interesting, but ultimately unfulfilling in a lot of ways. And then I kind of had like a, I don't know, come to Jesus sort of moment where I was like, why do I? What do I actually like about this stuff? And it was writing. It was like I don't. Out of all of my peer students, I didn't mind writing the papers, and I did okay with them. So like. I eventually kind of wormed my way towards English creative writing. Mm-hmm. 
just took until the end of my sophomore year, probably for me to, before I finally switched to English. And then it was kind of like, oh, I want to do this. Yeah. Uh, was there a, a teacher or a professor that, that you had that really influenced you to pursue your writing? Yeah. There was a few, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, in high school, there was a woman named Mrs. Tresca who I was underperforming. I had, I had intentionally failed the advanced placement test for English because I had, didn't want to be labeled a smart kid anymore. I was just tired of it and like the extra work and all that. So I was in the normal class and she could tell that I was like good with books and English and stuff. And I got like a C or a D on a test and she pulled me aside and was like, I don't know why you're not trying. I don't know why. She's like, I don't know. She's like, you can do this. In fact, you should be in the advanced class and you're not, you're, you're in this one. That's fine. Um, so she kind of challenged me and I, and I, it was like the first step. Um, I worked hard, um, and sort of started learning about just the basics of like object symbolism and how to read writing beyond just the surface level of things. And at the end of the semester, she was like, I signed you up for the AP exam. You're going to take it anyway. And I, did well enough on it that I didn't have to take composition in uh, college. <laughs> she was like kind of instrumental in, in allowing me to th- to believe in myself to think of to think abstractly. I guess mm-hmm. she was instrumental in that. And then in college, there was a guy who's a poet. His name was Dave Kelly. Um, I think he's still up there, in Geneseo, mm-hmm. or he might have retired, but he's still up there around there somewhere. And he had put out, by the time I met him, he was pretty salty and like pretty, you know, he was getting up there and he had put out a number of books and I remember being in his workshop, kind of the same thing where like I was not writing very well but I was trying to pretend that I was, you know, when you're like mm-hmm. in the first kind of couple workshops or whatever. And he was basically, he just pinned me to the wall essentially. And he was like, I know you think you're doing good, but you're not doing good enough. Um, and which I cried. And then, yeah. <laughs> and, then uh, and that was not uncommon in his workshops. People cried quite frequently. Mm-hmm. Um, but like some people would cry and then be like this, I can't do this. This isn't for me. For me, I was like, all right, you want to see writing? I'll show you writing. And so by degrees, I slowly kind of worked my way up. And he stuck with me to like his credit because I must have been annoying as hell. Mm-hmm. Like I would go to his office and he would have jazz records on and we would just chill out and like read and talk a little and play mm-hmm. chess or whatever. Um, he was really helpful. Not, and not only in like challenging me, but like making me feel like it's not, you know, it's a cool life, but it's not like any cooler than any other life. It's just what you do. You want to do this? This is what it's like. It demystified it for me, which was really good and really helpful when, you know, in my junior, senior year of college, I was wide eyed and, oh, I might be a poet or something. Mm -hmm. No, it was, he was like, yeah, maybe just do this first. Let's, let's see how far we can get. Mm -hmm. And there was a few other people there. There was a guy named Ken Asher, who was an English professor who had taught at, I don't know, an Ivy League school or something. He pulled me aside after class and was like, what do you want to do? I was like, I'm thinking about getting my MFA. Mm -hmm. And he was like, do it. And I was like, yeah, I don't know if I can can or not. And he was like, like, I've taught at all these places. You know, the only difference between somebody at a state school and somebody at a private school. And I was like, what? And he was like, they believe in themselves. They're willing to roll the dice. And most of the people at state schools are not encouraged or even taught to believe in themselves the same way. I don't know if that's been your experience, but sometimes with students here, I'll be like, mm-hmm. just try, you know, nothing to lose. This is, this is your life. So eventually like he kind of, that conversation really stuck with me. So I ended up tr- applying to MFA programs. Mm-hmm. Did you do that right after you graduated <laughs> or yeah, what, um, what happened there, There's sort of, there's sort of a story there. Yeah. I was married at the time. Oh, okay. Um, I got married to what was kind of a high school sweetheart. We weren't together in high school. Uh, I just had a huge crush on her. And uh, we got married my junior year. And to make a very kind of complicated story short, um, 
she moved in with me at, at college. I applied to MFA programs and I got into some of the ones that I really wanted to go to, like Sarah Lawrence and the new school and stuff. And I was like, hey, yeah, this is really cool. Would have had to pay because none of those places that I got into, they're really good, but they don't offer funding. Um, and she was like, do it. So I sent in my thing to Sarah Lawrence, uh, my like registration fee or whatever. And then she was like, you know what? I don't really want to move to Sarah Lawrence. Um, She's like, I want to move to Vermont to be near my family. Her brother was in Vermont. So anyway, um, I'd been accepted to the VCFA, the Vermont mm -hmm. College of Fine Arts. And I was like, okay, yeah, we'll figure something out. Like, we'll do it. And I moved to Vermont and didn't enroll in VCFA. In fact, it was like an hour away from where we were living in Burlington. Instead, I worked the night shift at Kinko's. 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. um, so overnight. That, and then the marriage quickly crumbled mm -hmm. and other and hilarity ensued. Mm -hmm. Moved to New York City and blah, blah, blah. Eventually became an editor. I don't know if th this is, I don't know if these are pertinent details. Oh, or not. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, whatever you want to say. How'd you end up at, in, in Texas? Mm. So I'd been in New York City for like four years. Mm -hmm. And my whole goal moving to New York City was I want to be an editor. Mm -hmm. Now, they don't just hand those jobs. That's a hard job to get. Yeah. <laughs> so I, when I moved to New York City, and I think this is kind of taking a long road with this, I started working at a children's bookstore and quickly was promoted to like manager of that bookstore. And that was okay. Left that job, worked at a software company, a lot of other stuff. Worked for I was an assistant for a feminist author named Phyllis Chesler, which was an interesting job. And finally... I got uh, a job as a, an assistant editor at Scholastic, like the children's press, but only in like this very specialized part of that. And once I was on the inside, I was like, this is cool, but I still just want to be a writer. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, I right. achieved the kind of goal of why I went to New York was like having an editorial job. And then I had it and I was like, <laughs> there's got to be more than this, man. Like I can't do this forever. So I applied to MFA programs for what would be the third time. I'd applied once in college, once again in New York, just on a lark and mm -hmm. didn't get the money I wanted. And the third time I applied, I got into Texas State and a few other ones. And Texas State um, guaranteed me a spot in a workshop with Lee Young Lee, like a semester long workshop. So like he was a visiting writer and they guaranteed uh, it was not a fully funded program at the time, but they guaranteed my funding. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll do it. And it would, I wanted something that was so wildly different than New York. And it was. Yeah. <laughs> I remember um, moving there and calling my mom and being like, mom, there's lizards on the ground. We <laughs> you don't know, get that. Ask, <laughs> how did that, that, that compare? It's, it's going to be just so different. Uh, I moved there in August too. And oh, it was no. so hot. Why? <laughs> I well, immediately called. I was going to start, but. <laughs> Yeah, I immediately called kind of everybody that I knew back in New York and I was like, uh, I might be coming back soon. Don't worry. Like I was freaked out. And then after a few days, I was like, all right, you know, this is OK. Um, I don't know. I remember when I was I'd been accepted to MFA programs that that round. I had a friend that was at George Mason and I'd been accepted to George Mason. I kept talking to him and he was like and I was like, I don't know what to do, man. And he said. When you got into Texas State, you were the most excited out of any of the places, just in your voice. You just sounded the most excited. And I was like, all right, that's the place. I think that something in me wanted so desperately to have a completely new experience that was just kind of my own. Mm -hmm. um, I moved there. I rented a house and moved there sight unseen. Literally drove from New York, bought an old car for my mom, packed it with all the stuff I could fit in it, and just mm -hmm. drove from New York to Texas, stopping at various points and like, you know, a motel in Baton Rouge or whatever, just whatever I could do. And then finally got there and thankfully it mostly worked out. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Texas was a trip, man. Yeah. Did you feel like it reinvigorated you as a writer changing, changing locations and um, places or I'm just wondering the, the connection between, you know, place, right, and the writing. your writing, your creativity, if you I mean, think about that at all. It's more for me, okay, a lot of it for me is, uh, it goes, always go back to that, goes back to that thing of like, 
if you are born into a poor, poor environment, um, uh, not only just like your family or whatever, but the county I grew up in is the second poorest county in New York behind the Bronx. Mm -hmm. um, it's like a very, very poor area of the country or of the New York state anyway. You kind of keep, you don't think you can do it. You just keep not thinking you can do it. And when I was in New York, I wrote, but like if you're working full time and you have to take an hour subway ride to like get to the place. And then I was living in Harlem, an hour subway ride back. Eventually you're so exhausted that like right. writing becomes this kind of secondary, maybe if I have time, I'll, I'll figure it out. Um, so it was less for me about the inspiration that I was finding and more about like, I need time. Like I desperately needed time away from sort of like the rat race working world sort of thing, which I just couldn't. I couldn't handle anymore. I started having anxiety attacks in the subway and stuff. Mm -hmm. I just, I wasn't, I wasn't able to live in New York City anymore. Yeah. And I would have had to get out one way or the other. I just got fortunate that this was a, kind of the escape route. Mm -hmm. um, and in that sense, the reinvigoration just comes as a result of like, somebody telling you you can do this. Like yeah. you're worth our time and money to teach you a little more mm -hmm. about being able to write. And that was like, that was big, you know, yeah. for me. And like, so just to reiterate this, like my family, nobody in my family has ever owned a business. Nobody's ever been a doctor. Nobody's been an engineer. Nobody's been a lawyer. Um, there's a very few of us that have gotten master's degrees. I'll be the first one to have a doctorate. Mm -hmm. So we're like just kind of a deeply rooted blue collar family that doesn't usually think about art, the arts, mm -hmm. you know, and that was what was important. I think getting to t getting out of New York City to Texas, mm -hmm. I think it's always been my trajectory. Even when yeah. I was like in New York City, I moved to New York City probably f just for you know, a young man sort of narcissism or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to escape the blue collar drudgery or whatever. Yeah. Um, and you just kind of keep pushing yourself and keep pushing yourself until somebody believes in you. That mm -hmm. was the big thing. Hmm. And I can't even remember what was in my application manuscript now. Like I don't mm -hmm. even, I don't yeah, even know what I said. Yeah, it's funny how that works. <laughs> just to, to blur all the, the all, things that you write and create. That I mean, that was over. You could kind of forget about. I know. It was over a decade ago now. Oh, like, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think I went to Texas State in 07 or 08. Must have been 08. So like. Is it a two-year program? Three? Three. Three-year. Mm -hmm. The cool thing about that program, too, is that once we learned this, it was great. They offer, once you graduate with an MFA, if you want to stick around and teach, they will figure out a way for you to stick mm -hmm. around and teach. They're, they're like kind of committed to supporting their yeah. graduates yeah. until they go off and find jobs. They're not gonna give you a tenure track job or anything like that, of course, but they'll like give you a reasonable wage that you could live on while you mm -hmm. kind of put your book together or do whatever else. Um, so that was nice. Ended up being in or around San Marcos for, until 2014, until I came here. Now, during that time, in 2010 is when you started writing the poems that would mm -hmm. appear in, in your book. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, what do you want to say about, about that? Uh, so I want to move to talking about your book. About the book a little more? Okay. Next, and maybe your journey so far yeah. here at Oklahoma State, our um, PhD program for creative writing. So the book is about... Um, my ex-girlfriend, whose name was Jenny Risley, mm -hmm. um, and without getting into too much detail with that, she uh, committed suicide in February 2010. Mm -hmm. February 2010, yeah. Um, and I kind of immediately began writing almost in a not manic, but just almost like journaling or something. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted yeah. somebody to talk to and there was nobody around that you really, who was really going through it the same way I was going through it. They were, but I just couldn't see them. I was so locked into this like survivor's guilt and sure. like all this stuff that I just started kind of writing stuff uh, almost just as a reaction, like mm -hmm. as you might do. Um, and then after a while, uh, I started showing it to some people and they were like, this is very, you know, interesting and strong and like mm -hmm. heartbreaking a little. And I was like, some of it was so sad that I couldn't show it to anybody. Some of it was like dark and sad. Yeah. Uh, but some of it I was showing it to people and, and they, they seemed to, you know, respond to it. Um, 
so that I wrote kind of semi-consistently after her death, I wrote a bunch of um, kind of poems to her mm -hmm. or poems about like my coping with the grief. Um, I found it difficult to write about anything else mm -hmm. after a while. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. Like oh, I was, that makes total sense. I yeah. was like so locked into like this is the way I grieve that yeah. it, that it became difficult to write about other things. Like I felt like I was, um, what's the right word, kind of neglecting or um, betraying her in some way if I wrote about other things. Mm -hmm. um, and I sort of made a promise to myself that I would write a book about it, et cetera, et cetera. Like that people would know her name and stuff, and a kind of flimsy grief coping mechanism i think right. um yeah so were you workshopping some of these poems in mm -hmm. in school and did you continue doing that once and you came to oklahoma state I, I didn't do too much at texas state like i was okay. a little nervous because a lot yeah. of people like she was in the workshop she was in the program um so we all knew her and the whole program was kind of in mourning after this oh, happened. Um, yeah, I mean, it was like heavy duty. Um, she was in my year of the program. So me and all of my friends, literally, it's the, this is the situation. Um, she passed in what would have been the second semester of our second year. And I returned to class for the first time. And there's an empty chair. And we all know who should be sitting in that chair. Uh, and it's just kind of like... And you just kind of go on, right? Like yeah. you just, you have to almost pretend like nothing's happened. Um, so I didn't really workshop it that much at mm -hmm. Texas State just because it just sense. would have felt strange to everybody, you know? Yeah. Um, when I came here, those were some of the first poems I workshopped here. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Was stuff that was kind of dealing with more my end of it like my coping with, mm -hmm. which is what really the book is about it's not really that much about her right. it's more about like me like what why what i was coping with mm -hmm. um they didn't really get a good reception strangely i didn't get a good reception in the workshop they started getting published and i was yeah. like oh okay uh but the people in the workshop were a little like oh, i don't know about this but they that, even know what to do with that when you write about mm -hmm. you know because you're you write about a death, and maybe all death is traumatic, but a suicide is mm -hmm. especially so. It's jarring, and we don't really talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, much less have to critique your your craft. Yeah. That, so I, I wonder if it just made people that, uncomfortable because they don't want to. I think that's part of it. That, yeah, maybe? well, one of the weird things I found, and this is kind of fascinating too, is I also took nonfiction workshops here too. And I wrote mm -hmm. some things about about Jenny and that experience as well. And some people just haven't gone through grief that hard. Yeah. And and people that have could get it. They were like, I understand completely what these sets of images and ideas are relating to. And the people that hadn't just were like, I don't understand why anybody would act like this. And I was like, wow, is it really that big a gap? And I think it kind of is for some people. Mm -hmm. Like they just don't, they've never had to deal with that level of grief. Um, so I found it, it was kind of interesting in like an audience sort of study sense where I was like, oh, I, I see. Okay, these guys are my readers. These guys aren't so much, but it's not anybody's fault. It's just you have to have de had dealt, had some dealing with it. Yeah, we don't really make a space for that kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Um, and I kind of wrote about that in that piece you were talking about, like mm -hmm. the outside of like a therapist's office. And I did go to therapy for a little while just because I was not doing well. Yeah. Um, outside of a therapist's office, nobody wants to hear it. They're just like, right. you know, it's very American in a way or like American it, it, male. It, it, it definitely Deal, is. It's a, it's a very Western, mm -hmm. maybe... Yeah, I, I like how you put that American yeah. way to, to, to deal with it. But then, um, and this is going back to the your essay in the in the millions, the way people would react. Like you wrote about a woman in Vermont who broke down cry, crying, yeah. talking about the loss of her husband or someone else who had lost their mom to suicide. And just, yeah. there's some elements, there's some aspects of grief if they're not like this. I want to say there's a standard way to die, but you know what I mean? Yeah. There's some things you just can't talk about. Yeah. Uh, 
I think it's difficult for people because we're people are trained to be ashamed of their own reaction to it. Yes. That's the big part, right? Yeah. Um, and that happens like it's happened here in Oklahoma when I've did, done some readings around here. People come up after and kind of shuffle up and be like, hey, you know, this is really interesting. Like my so and so passed and I couldn't make it to their funeral and I, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'll kind of sit there and not knowing really what they want from me, except maybe somebody that, that to listen that mm -hmm. won't be like, oh, stop talking. Be like, oh, wow, I'm sorry, but thanks for coming out. And, you know, if you need to talk, like, that's fine. Um, yeah, it's really weird. There's no there's no place for that kind of. I, I also grew up in the northern New York's kind of New Englandy, and everybody's mm -hmm. very, you don't really talk about it. Mm -hmm. I remember when my grandmother passed, my grandfather just wasn't, wouldn't talk to anybody at the funeral. Didn't like pr give a eulogy or anything. Was just kind of like, mm -hmm. just kind of deal with it and go on. Yeah, or put it into those five stages of grief. Yeah, like the Kubler Ross. Yeah. Method where you know you you you've got these step one, two, three, four, and five, and then yeah. and then you're just supposed to be normal again yeah. and, and not. Um. What if the fact it's a? Uh, I wrote it down: denial, anger, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Acceptance is always the last one, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but do, do we ever accept? No. <laughs> that's any of this, I, you I think know? that like or we just go on. Those that seems to be a good model for somebody who's dealing with maybe a lighter grief. Yeah. Um, not having to deal with death, maybe. Mm -hmm. But people, I mean, death is irrevocable. There's no way to like. Well, okay, everything's fine now. Like, you know, once somebody that you love leaves your life, it's like there's always going to be kind of a hole there, no matter what, it's a parent or whoever, I think. So I'm not sure how firmly vested I am in, like, in fact, this book frequently refutes that those five stages actually do anything. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of harmful yeah. <laughs> in, in a way yeah. to make other people think that, you know, you need to be sad for this amount of time. Mm. You can be angry for this amount of time. Yeah. And then after a while, can't you just quit talking about them already? Yeah. You know, and just, and just let it go. I mean, I think in terms of therapy, I get it mm -hmm. right. You, you, if you're in a therapist's office and a therapist is trying to get you to like find some sense of closure or at least acceptance, Acceptance meaning in this sense, like, this is what happened. It's not going to, you know, the person's not going to come back. You can't fix anything that we wronged uh, in their lifetime or whatever. You can't kind of go back and fix things. Um, that I sort of understand. But yeah, in day-to-day -day life, you know, the, the empty chair is going to be there, like, every day. Yeah. So much so that anytime you see an empty chair at a certain point, you're going to be like reminded of that first empty chair, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's just kind of how the brain works, right? Yeah. So I wanted to talk about the cover image. Oh, yeah. The book. So it's uh, Paper Dolls, yeah. right? Yeah, tell me tell me about that. Maybe the poem that goes along with um, it. And why that image and not, not something else? You know, when I was talking to the publisher about the cover, they initially we're pitching like high resolution photographs of like landscapes or, and like a lot of black would be involved. And I was like, man, that is just not what I really want. I want it to be kind of, you not, I want you as the reader or the viewer of the book to not quite know what's coming. Like mm -hmm. I want you to read it and, or look at the cover and be like, I don't even know what this means really. Um, and so like that poem, uh, if you ever become a paper doll, mm -hmm. which is like in the first section of the book, I think, mm -hmm. um, is one of the few surrealist sort of abstract poems that it's about searching for connectivity, right? Mm -hmm. Like, except with a chain of paper dolls, of course, there's yeah. always, there's dolls at the ends that aren't, they're reaching out for somebody who will never reach back. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought that that was kind of apt for the cover and that yeah. image of like, okay, You'll, the chain eventually ends and there's always going to be someone who's who's kind of that keeps reaching and, and again mm -hmm. it goes back to that not closure thing mm -hmm. I think like that it's the chain doesn't really 
you know, when you make a chain of paper dolls, it's not circular, it has ends, and it's never going to be fully clo closed. And I, that, I encouraged them toward this, and then they designed this, like, uh, image up, and then I was like, yeah, I like it. I was like, let's mm -hmm. go with that. I like it that it's kind of cryptic. Yeah, it, it's unexpected, kind of like the title. Yeah. And the <laughs> yeah. title yeah. poem that, I mean, it really is just kind of, I don't want to say in your face, but it's just like we were saying before, it's just something that I know other people experience if they've gone through a grief mm -hmm. on you know, it, yeah. of this magnitude. You know, we talked about this um, in a different conversation that, that we weren't recording, but we talked about um, poet Gregory Orr yeah. a little bit, you know, who accidentally shot his brother when he was 12. Yeah. And he kind of made a career out of writing about that, just that one yeah. horrible traumatic experience. And he says he, he views poetry as a way to make sense of the disorder of our lives as a way to create create meaning to kind of give give us meaning yeah i'm wondering what you think about that or what you think poetry does for you in that in that sense i mean boy that's kind of a big question mm -hmm. um i understand what he's saying i think i agree with him mm -hmm. If poetry does anything for me, it points to the junctures where language fails. Mm -hmm. um, it, it does its best, right? Like poetry yeah. is attempting to those places that you can't talk about or can't identify emotionally or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I had a friend who once said, uh, where philosophy where philosophy ends, poetry begins. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's more how I think of it is like, I don't think of it as an, I guess it does make us make a certain sense of order, mm -hmm. um, but only artificially. Yeah. It's artifice. So like right. your, your attempt, the effort I think is what matters most. Mm -hmm. And like, I keep, I always tell my friends too. like if somebody gives me a poem to critique or something, I'm like, you're writing about what you know and that's yeah. fine. But the best, poems I read are people that write toward the things they they can't identify. They're trying to get to something that is bigger than the language could ever encapsulate, even mm -hmm. across like a three page poem or something. It's got to be so big. Um, mm -hmm. Not the poem itself, but like the idea has to be all around the poem. So in a certain way, it's like, I don't know if this is what Gregory Orr was saying. Maybe it is. It gives order to a much larger idea without defining it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So I think he also talks about people having a, a, a threshold of, of being able to, to process something or not. So when you, yeah. you read something, it moves you or it doesn't move you. Yeah. If you read a poem and it does move you for some reason that maybe you just feel it, you can't necessarily verbalize it. Right, yeah. Then that's that... Maybe that's kind of that thing that you're talking about mm -hmm. where it's not language that we're using necessarily because poetry taps into something higher. Yeah. That's what makes it. Ideally. Poetry, maybe. Yes, yeah. Or you try. Or that's yeah, you it. try. That's an, that's an aim. Yeah. That, that, again, I think that's what it is, yeah. is that the effort is what it means. Like somebody's mm -hmm. trying to reach out to you. Yeah. And one thing, and this is kind of a different topic, I'm mean, thinking about closure, and we've already talked about how that's kind of a myth that's sort of mm -hmm. this on, ongoing process. Um, but then I'm also thinking about the details that, that you include in your poems that are, you include such ordinary things sometimes, but mm -hmm. in a way that's just, devastating and to great effect. I mean, it's, if you're a person who has dealt with grief, then you'll get this when yeah. you read the poems. And I'm thinking of, um, like packing up the house yeah. 
or you are not your ex girlfriend's museum, and, yeah. 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 Museum and just it's it's those little things or even in why didn't it go to your funeral? Mm-hmm. Um, let's see, like just the way you you ended it, I would have said, I would have gone to say goodbye, but I was all that was left. Drink instead, yeah. or you talk about the friends coming over with the flowers and yeah, you know, just I didn't even know that backstory to everyone else's and a connection to right. Jenny in your workshop, but yeah. just as a reader, there was just this intimacy with, with the friends who were there, who were trying to kind of felt like they were trying to grieve in the, the yeah. proper way, the way you're supposed to. Yeah. With flowers and so yeah, forth. And you're and expressing and... something that I think a lot of people probably end up feeling or wanting to do Yeah, anyway, you know, and that's, what makes that I think yeah so powerful I don't remember who I was talking to about this um, but something happens when you lose when you go through that level of grief right Mm -hmm. Uh, without you knowing it there's there's like sort of the BC and AD of that like you have been your life has officially been sectioned right Mm -hmm. and there's a there's kind of you that continues on that you know that you're who you are but then there's like this other kind of like this crook in a line where you're like, okay, I'm going on in this direction now too, because that's, again, it's irrevocable. There's no getting it back. Mm -hmm. Um, And this this sort of split in identity almost, like that you have to confront your own, um, I don't know, not multiple identities, because I don't know if that's the right term at all, but your own sort of multiplicity in some way where you're like, okay, I have to be able to deal with this grief, but at the same time, I have to continue living my life in a way that isn't going to ruin me on a day-to-day basis. Mm-hmm. Um, and do it for me, that was a very big like. And then you, and then a lot of the poems are that it's kind of seeing from uh, almost an omniscient perspective, like okay, their friends are here, and this is what's happening, and you don't really quite feel you feel emotionally invested in a way that nobody else is. Mm-hmm. And also you feel completely emotional, emotionally like drained. Yeah. Um, and so you're kind of always watching and trying to see what's going on around you as though you weren't part of it. Mm-hmm. Because that's how it felt. Mm-hmm. And that, that's kind of when I, when I kind of locked into some of the vocal register of these poems, that's what was, what it was for me. It was like mm-hmm. this sort of leaps between these objects and images and people that, I would hope for a reader made it feel like kind of this devastated sort of just eyeball looking around, um, Mm -hmm. just trying to witness and like absorb what it was like. It's like a, it's the same thing. It's like coping. It's literally just like somebody like, how does one even cope with this? Like all this stuff is going Mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering if you felt, I know this from, from therapy, kind of a therapy trick. Mm -hmm. And I guess there's a lot of research about it too, but the act of writing itself, especially like the pen or pencil in your hand and um, moving across the page, it, it grounds the, it grounds the body. It kind of refocuses Mm -hmm. the attention. Did you feel like was writing part of your actual therapy? Like, did you have psychologists or therapists who recommended that? that you try the expressive writing. I think you mentioned James Pennebaker and yeah. your yeah, and your essay and all that research about yeah. expressive writing that's been going on since the 80s. I had, yeah, there's like, you know, poetry therapy and like mm-hmm. writing therapy and there's all yeah. that. And I had been doing that pretty consistently. And then I was at a, I think I was at a therapist appointment with my therapist and I was like, the problem now seems to be that I am, rather than coping with my grief in a normal way, I have started holding it until I'm at the typer or with a pen in my hand. And she's like, well, that's not good. And I was like, I know. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, She's like, so take a little, maybe step back and don't write about some of these things that you feel and just cognitively feel them. And I was like, okay. Um, Because I think I was doing it too much. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was sick at a certain point. Like it was not good. 
and I, and I know I did it for the best of it with the best of intentions. Like I really wanted to memorialize her and this experiment experience, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it was not, you know, at a certain point I had to get away from it and like just not write. And so would hang out with friends more or started mm-hmm. playing basketball and doing stuff that like normal human beings do. And mm-hmm. yeah. that was better for me at the time. Yeah, it <laughs> yeah. can become a compulsion because you're, I mean, there's a difference between writing for a therapeutic purpose because when you're, when you're doing that, there's no intent to show it to anyone. Mm-hmm. But you're writing as a professional writer, someone who's yeah. mastering the craft of what you're learning yeah. to do. So then you're, yep. it, it's going to become a, a part of you in this different way right. and with this heavy topic. Yeah, and it, like so. How yeah. do you ever separate yeah. yourself from that and even get through a workshop or edits of the book? So that, that yeah. that's the thing, right? Is like, and I also you have to keep the background of this, like you know. She was in the MFA program. I was in the second year of the MFA program. So at the time, everything was focused on outward facing writing, mm-hmm. um, not journalistic, or not like right. journaling writing. Yeah. So like, I was already kind of in a place where I was pre-programmed to, to sort of push everything outward to, an, uh, to a reader. Yeah. Um, and like, that was not helpful in a certain way, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, like living alone was difficult for a while too. For the, I think for the same reasons, you know, you're just like, it, like just hearing the clock tick or whatever you're like oh my god like this is what it's like <laughs> just mm-hmm. mid second by second just kind of trying to figure out how to deal with it um, which brings it all back to I mean it brings it reinforces the need for you to write that's what I would say like oh okay well if you've nobody here to talk to then I'll write to myself or whatever or write to an imagined other mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. became kind of unhealthy at a certain point um, which took a lot, kind of a lot of work and like a lot of anxiety attacks and, you know, late mm-hmm. nights and probably too much drinking and stuff and all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like multi-layered. I think that's yeah. why. Yeah. Yeah. Multi-layered. That's a good way to put it. So you're still in the PhD program here, but mm-hmm. how's that experience been for you so far and what are your goals? Just generally? I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's been pretty good. Mm-hmm. I mean, the the program here is an interesting one. It's a very like we have one of the oldest, I think, in the yeah. country, like if not the oldest PhD program. Yeah, like it's been amazing. around for a while um, in creative writing, anyway. Um, I kind of got exactly what I needed unintentionally. <laughs> I don't think mm-hmm. I, it was anybody's express purpose to get me the, the tools and things that I needed. But it really worked out in like kind of every way possible. Um, my goal is now, like I should be graduating this next semester, mm-hmm. I hope. Um, I'd like to stay in the area, mm-hmm. to be quite frank. I really like it here. Yeah. Um, and so I, last year I interviewed at, a, at TCC for a job. Um, there's some jobs open around Oklahoma that I'd be happy to take. Mm-hmm. Of course, you know what it's like. Like you get, you just kind of right. got to take the job you get eventually. But exactly. that's like the next step. And I'm sending out the manuscript right now and kind of working on some new stuff. And mm-hmm. we'll see. Yeah. I like, I feel like I can do it now. Put mm-hmm. it that way, you know. And it's yeah. not an easy thing. Again, this for me, it all ties back to like the sort of blue collar thing, which mm-hmm. is like, you know, I'm the first person in my family to publish a book, definitely. So like, I mean, how do you believe in it when you have no? There's no archetype. There's no like, some, there's mm-hmm. nobody in your family that's a writer or anything. You just kind of have to do it, you know? Yeah. Um, and that was one of the things here that I got. Because this is like a blue collar place, you know? It's mm-hmm. Oklahoma. Yeah. And like Oklahoma State is definitely kind of a blue collar school. So I, I felt very at home mm-hmm. with what was going yeah, on here. Yeah, I was going to ask what, what do you like about Oklahoma? And do you feel like this as a place nurtures your writing or does it have anything to do with it? Oh, no, it? I think it does. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the project I'm working on now is sort of um, deals with the intersections between politics and like Christian evangelicalism. Okay. You've and got also some material around yeah. here. <laughs> and some and like Americana and stuff. And this is oh, a great okay. area for all of that. Yeah. Like, is this your prayer book for America? Yeah, this is like prayer book. Yeah. Um, then like I've sent it around for a while and it's gotten some good responses and stuff. Mm-hmm. And like I'm 
very confident somebody will eventually pick it up. But I don't think I would be able to write that without living here. Um, because mm. seeing the sort of, you know, when you're from up north, and I grew up in a very red area up north, okay? Yeah. Like, it's very rural, it's very red. Um, and I think I was just too young to notice everything that was happening. Right. How frequently people around here vote and think against their own interests yeah. as a result of some, like, media uh, brainwashing or something is incredible. Mm -hmm. Like, it's almost like a miracle to witness. You're like, oh my God, how can you believe that? Mm -hmm. um, and they do because they, I, that's just what people believe. It's And it's tied to, I think, Christianity in a lot of ways. Um, I did not grow up, I've never been to church. I've never mm -hmm. been to a church service in my life, um, except for weddings and funerals. I've never been to an actual communion or whatever. Like. Mm -hmm. Um, and so get kind of an outsider's perspective on the whole thing too. And it's incredible to watch people support somebody who is so clearly demented or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then not to make this overtly political, but like, um, and then you have to think, okay, so if God is good and rewards those who are like righteous and this person has been rewarded X amount of times, then of course they have to support him because that just reifies their belief system so hard. Um, and I, that has been like fascinating to watch in a lot of ways. Like I was living in Texas when Obama won uh, and there was jubilance. Yeah. The area I was in in Texas was very blue and it was like, oh man. And like I, I didn't realize how kind of blue Texas really is. And it is, a lot of it is, mm -hmm. especially the urban areas. But here it's like, a whole different level of red. <laughs> like, right. It's super red. And I was very inspired by, like when I started writing that book, I would go around to the churches in town. It was like talking to people and getting like materials and stuff and doing like research online and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, just because I, it's something that I think a lot of people who don't live in like rural, like Oklahoma or Arkansas or like a very red state just don't understand right. at all. Yeah. Like they have no idea how people think the way that they think. And so I was like, somebody's got to write about yeah. something. That and all the contradiction, mm -hmm. you know, if you didn't put a label on things, half the time I think people would vote in their own interest and be a little more to the left. Right. I mean, we do have our socialist history. Yes. Yeah. Here, which people seem to... Forget, forget about, which, you know, I guess that's kind of the problem with yeah. history. We so quickly forget it, man. Yeah. Don't remember it. I did want to go back to your book yeah. real quick. Um, so I'm always interested in the choices poets make uh, when they pick their the opening poem and the and their closing mm -hmm. one. So could you tell me about that? Because you've got, why I didn't go to your funeral? Yeah. It's the first one and then taking the canoe out at night. And I just looked at the last the last lines and the images, I think I already quoted this one, but you end the first poem by saying, I would have gone to say goodbye, but I was all that was left. I drank instead. And then with the canoe one, you're out in the water, stabbing the sur surface lightly. Mm -hmm. Every so yeah. often gripping the haft of the paddle yeah. and stabbing the surface, light surface lightly, just to make sure I'm still moving. Mm -hmm. um, Part of that is Jenny was like a, a super nature oriented mm -hmm. person. Um, and that appears lightly in the book a little, but there's some stories about her and like nature. There's a poem that didn't make it into this book about her um, rescuing an injured raccoon from the side of the road, oh. like swaddling it in blankets and taking it back to the house and attempting to like turn it into a pet. Um, that did not work out well for uh -huh. her. Like I came yeah. up one day and she had like scratches all on her and I'm like, what happened? And she was like, oh yeah, it didn't work out. <laughs> um, so that's part of that, like the canoe yeah. part. The other part is like, in the beginning, I think the beginning of the book, and if there's a movement to the book, I think mm -hmm. it's toward like this feeling like you're the focal point, like the absolute center. And that's what grief does to you. It makes mm -hmm. you like, like the first lines are like, you know, a blubbering focus, mm -hmm. like a frantic epicenter. You're just kind of this still point around which everything seems to be moving except you. And like, so the end of the book kind of comes back to this, um, you don't know what direction you're moving in. You don't even know if you're moving, but there's definitely motion. And you're like, okay, I'm still 
I can be still and I have to like kind mm-hmm. of deal with that um, in a natural way or in like an organic way and not feel fear- fearful for it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because I don't think the last poem is nearly as like um, frantic or has a very kind of methodical, what's the right word? Um, it's a very sort of calm energy to it mm-hmm. where just somebody, you know, taking a canoe out and it's night and you're kind of like looking at the stars and kind of just dealing with things and feeling okay being still. Yeah. And like knowing that you're moving, but feeling okay with that stillness versus like the early poems in the book where it's kind of like this sort of frantic, uh, yeah, I can't Yeah, definitely be still. A, different, a different energy mm-hmm. to it. Yeah. I thought it was a good ending image to have. The counterpoint kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, once you get through the yeah the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I like the way that that ended. So I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about your your writing process. Okay. Could you uh, take, let's start <laughs> with with a poem? So take me through that first image or sensation or moment of feeling inspiration to. Like your just, final draft. In just general? maybe, yeah, just in general. Uh, so God. you're someone who like maybe <laughs> feels the because some poets I've I've talked to they say well, you know it'll be a line that I'll just get and it mm-hmm. will go away or some people feel the shape of the poem before they write down any words. Um, I find. Okay. Usually for me, it's, there's, uh, there has to be a central image that has emotional resonance Mm -hmm. that hasn't been used that much before or at all before, ideally. Um, and that can, and and maybe image isn't even the right word, maybe a situation with emotional content Mm -hmm. built into it. Some poets I think work well without any walls. They just kind of they love the freedom of it. I am mm-hmm. not one of those poets. Mm-hmm. I need to be inside a little box. Yeah. And if I can build myself a little box where there's like a situation or an image or something that I can feel the emotional content in it, then I know exactly what direction to head in. And then the images and everything in the language kind of pile up for me. And then editing just becomes an issue of like, well, that image isn't working or like this whole situation needs to be changed or gone. Mm-hmm. But I don't really... I guess the shape of it, kind of, mostly I do it just top down. Mm -hmm. Um, Like sometimes I'll write half a poem and kind of leave it and be like, I'm not sure this is going to work or I can't get to the place I need to get Mm -hmm. um, from where I've started right now. And I'll come back to it later and be like, oh, there, that was the problem. And then kind of like take that line out or whatever and switch a couple things. And then I can get to a place where that, where I can relate that emotional resonance to a reader. Cause when I say like a situation or an image with emotional resonance, I mean, for me, mm-hmm. um, and like, I think the, all the poetry I'm drawn to is that kind of poetry that, um, feels like it's reaching out to you. Yeah. That it's an idea you've had before that, or a feeling you've had before that nobody's expressed. And you're like, Oh my God, like mm-hmm. I felt that too. Um, those are always the best poems for me. And so that's kind of what I try to do. Um, Usually, this book notwithstanding, maybe I, I don't know. Like this book is this book. Right. And I, like I said, working on a book now, it's about politics and evangelicalism. Like that's like mm-hmm. I, I think I, this was like this might end up being an anomaly in some ways. But yeah. I kind of don't mind altering my vocal register for every book mm-hmm. if, if necessary, whatever the poem deserves. Um, yeah, I do. I kind of structure it top down. Voice is the most important thing to me. Like. Yeah whatever the vocal register is, has to be defined immediately within the first like two to, two to four lines. Mm-hmm. Um, and after that, whatever the shape of the poem is, the shape it is. And I can edit it for that vocal register, which sometimes, like I've been working on stuff that uses the page, it's maximalist. Mm-hmm. So like there'll be some lines that kind of read almost like a paragraph and then like other things that are line broken, um, just because that needs to be the vocal register and that needs to be the tools at work for that specific topic, which might be a little more high minded or something, mm-hmm. you know, depending yes. on whatever the subject matter, the poem needs. Mm-hmm. Do you have yeah. any writing rituals or 
Uh, Are you a routine person? I am. I try to be. Uh-huh. I try to work. I have a I have a little electronic like clock stopwatch, mm-hmm. uh, and I'll set it for usually at least an hour. Mm-hmm. Okay, and this is what kind of what I recommend to everybody yeah. that like wants to be a poet or a writer of any kind. Like, and you don't if you start writing and you're writing well, that clock will not matter. Mm-hmm. When it's hard, making yourself sit there and kind of think for an hour is a really good tactic. Like, yeah. cause there'll be a moment for me, it's the moment at which I stop thinking about, Oh, I'm going to write something. And I start kind of like spacing mm-hmm. and then something will happen. Like it happens in that like instant where you don't yeah. expect it to happen. And your mind ends up drifting off to some place where you remember or notice something and you're like, Oh wow. And like, that's the poem. Like that, that mm-hmm. spot that you can't, that you have, realized before and it's like a puzzle you can't solve and your brain wants to go to it you know mm-hmm. yeah. um you just have to like kind Getting of into sh- that part of your subconscious yeah it's... you have to shut your mind off enough yeah, yeah. and that for that reason i also generally write incredibly late at night like okay. if i start writing at 1 a.m that's usually early mm-hmm. sometimes i'll start like two and end up at like five in the morning mm-hmm. um my sleep pattern is uh not good uh, my <laughs> sleep yeah i don't sleep well um yeah. But, you know, and it, whatever, sometimes it'll be earlier, whatever inspiration tri- strikes, but it's usually after I know the world is kind of a, asleep mm-hmm. and I'm starting to kind of wind down. And that part of your brain that wants to like worry yeah. about, oh, I've got a, these are the responsibilities I have to take care of. And here's what happens tomorrow or whatever. Mm-hmm. When you're just so tired, that part of your brain is so tired that you're like, I can't think about that anymore. Mm-hmm. And you're kind of sitting at your computer. And maybe sometimes I'll play a little game or something on the computer just to kind of get my myself in the seat and then after that then I can write it's usually like just making myself be there mm-hmm. yeah the discipline part mm-hmm. I think seems to be the key mm-hmm. <laughs> that everyone so far in this I mean series talks about yeah. you get, get the book done I mean I wish I was more disciplined to be quite frank like and I, I go through spurts mm-hmm. like with the the first draft of this manuscript that I'm sending around now the prayer book one um, I wrote over a summer, I think in 2017, like mm-hmm. a summer into the fall semester. I was like editing it up and stuff. And I was like, that's great. Um, and I still wrote little piecemeal things after that or prose or you know, mm-hmm. little essays for, for websites or something. Um, but I don't think that's bad either. Like I try to sit down as much as I can, but some days it doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. And you're like, you can't be pissed at yourself right. because there's another, there's another hour coming the next day. Yeah. It's going to be, the, that's the ritual of it. It's like, you always know there's going to be another shot. I find that people uh, that I talk to who are like, I'm a slow writer or, um, boy, I really just need to be in the right mood. I, I feel like those people are just people that have never put themselves in a place to ritualize it. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and I try to encourage them. I'm like, hey, I understand what you're saying. Just try this for a month or like try it for a week and see what happens. And eventually, once you don't have to, once you don't have the fear of getting everything out perfectly right now, because there might not be time later, mm-hmm. once that fear is gone, it becomes very easy. You know, if you screw up, if you don't write anything, who cares? You can do it again tomorrow. It's not a big deal. Um, and that takes all the pressure off of like, Oh, it's gotta be brilliant or it's gotta yeah. be perfect on a Nothing's first draft. The first Everything's enough. junk. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're just kind of getting what you need to get from your subconscious, maybe. Get exactly. It down, get words and then you can, mm-hmm. then you can It almost it. is journaling at that level. Like it almost yeah. is kind of like that's the ritual of like, okay, there's something that's been bothering me and I don't know how to say it, but I'm gonna start saying stuff. Yeah, those unexpected connections. <laughs> yeah. You know, that you wouldn't make. With your analytical yeah, yeah. Mind. that's the big yeah that's the thing too and i guess when we were talking before about that process i think that's the way i write top down i guess not shape not in terms of shape or anything because mm-hmm. i think i think understand what people say mean when they say that but like i find that's the best way for me to make super unexpected connections for myself i'm like oh mm-hmm. i didn't realize that was coming like just yeah. kind of a left turn which is the most that's why we write anyway right yeah, like that's you want to surprise yourself mm-hmm. like I didn't know that was in me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How do you recharge or relax or give yourself, you know, the breaks we need to Man. create things? 
like you have time. <laughs> Maybe you'll I have know. time over this break. That's the thing is I kind of don't. Um, yeah. Let's see. I have a pretty... So I live with my partner, Katie. Mm-hmm. Um, and like we'll watch, you know, we have like Sunday night, like we'll watch the whatever HBO series is on or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have a pretty strict regimen of hanging out with my friends. Mm-hmm. Like Wednesday nights and Friday or Saturdays. I need to be there. And to be quite frank, it's usually like we'll meet up at the bar or whatever. Mm-hmm. I need to to sort of serve my brain oblivion for a little while (laughs) so that it feels like I'm taking a vacation from something. Mm -hmm. Um, And that that's usually enough. And some nights I'll go out and like hang out with them and then wake up the next day and and not just be kind of full, like Mm -hmm. absolutely full or go to a reading or something like that and just feel like I'm full. I don't have the money to travel, Mm -hmm. which would be kind of nice, but I can't do that. Um, so usually it's yeah hanging out with friends or I'm mean, gonna exercise semi frequently. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, during the semester, and I'm sure you know this too. Like it's just a nightmare. Like, right. I have a friend, Tomas Marin, um, who I was talking to him about his process, and he was like, "Yeah, during the semester, I just don't even write anymore." He's like, "I don't even try." Mm-hmm. He's like, "Maybe I'll make some notes or whatever, but I'm not trying to do a full draft of anything." Yeah. And I'm like, "Oh, okay." And it kind of when I talked to him about it, I was like, "Yeah." kind of gives you license a little bit to, to feel mm-hmm. that way. Like, I think a lot of people feel that way. Yeah. Like this you is to have that quiet space. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a good thing. That is. I do. I'm lucky because our house, we live very close to campus. So I mm-hmm. walk to work, which, which people say is one of the secrets to a long life. Mm-hmm. Live within walking distance of your work or with a, within a quick drive. Um, and I have an upstairs office that's all to myself, mm-hmm. which is also very great. I love that. So I do have kind of infinite space and time. It's just a matter of managing stress during the semester. Mm-hmm. You know, that's always the thing that gets in the way is just managing my stress, like sleeping yeah. enough and like, oh, I have to grade. It really uh-huh. would be great to write this poem right now or start this essay or whatever. Mm-hmm. But Yeah, just the mental energy yeah, and emotional energy required mm-hmm. for teaching, yeah. writing and all of that. that can... It's kind of a performance art if you do yeah. it well. Like if you yes. teach, like you're kind of up there, like trying to keep them entertained for – you know, an hour at a time, mm-hmm. it's exhausting. Yeah. Because I've had jobs, and I'm sure you have too, mm-hmm. where like you might work a solid three hours out of an eight hour day and the rest of the day you're kind of just like, you know, doing something, check an email or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's not like hard work. I'm teaching, like you're on, you are on. It's all of you. Yeah. It's, and if you're not, then you'll get called out on it. Yeah, there's 20 people that are Students just are looking. relentless. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like there's 20 people always looking at you. And yeah. It's like you can't, you know, kind of relax and be like, oh my God, I don't want to be here. Like you, you kind of have to be, yeah. all right, let's learn Send about. Send a quick text under your desk like <laughs> all our students do. I know. Like we don't see that. They do. I'm like, stop looking at your crotch. <laughs> I know what's in your crotch. Uh-huh. It's not that interesting. Yeah. It's your I'm standing up here. <laughs> I can see you. Yeah, so that's good that you have friends to support you that's and nice, yeah. a supportive partner. Would, yeah, she's she's imagine. great. Kitty, usually that's my first. That's important too. Yes, it is. She's usually my first editor. Mm-hmm. Like if I find if I have something that I'm like kind of grappling with, um, I'll send it to Katie. Mm-hmm. Like I just finished my a, a draft of my critical introduction to the what is going to be my thesis, mm-hmm. and I sent it to her first. And she usually has great ideas. She was in the MFA program. She was okay. yeah in the same yeah. year. So how's that for weird? Um, <laughs> and she was also a friend of Jenny's. So when we kind of came together in the wake of all that mm-hmm. briefly and then like took time and did other stuff. And then eventually we both started like drifting back toward one another. Mm-hmm. Um, so she's also like kind of deeply invested in this subject matter and just kind of like we have a shared past. Mm-hmm. It's a little like binding, I guess, a little not in a good way, like a kind of. Yeah. She understands me, and I can understand her. Mm-hmm. I guess you know. Yeah. But she has an MFA, and she's a great editor. So <laughs> that yeah. helps. Well, that, yeah. yeah, that helps. Yeah, for sure. So what's the best writing advice that you've been given? Hmm. And what advice would you give? The best writing advice I've been given. Um, I guess I would say. Boy, that's hard, man. I was just writing something about this, too. I 
I don't know at what level you mean this question either. So the, the f- however you want to, <laughs> however you want to do it. Um, some of the best writing advice, I was just literally just writing about this, um, was, um, know your habits. Hmm. Um, essentially meaning like both in how you best write like that thing where I was saying like I write well with inside inside a box mm-hmm. with given absolute freedom I will screw it up every time mm-hmm. um, you have to know those habits you're like who are you like yeah. know what you are but also know your habits like okay if you're using the same construction over and over again or if you're ending a poem the same way over and over again or if like you're using the same image so many times that it's starting to become trait or same word or whatever. Mm-hmm. You have to change like something like that's how you grow as a writer is like recognizing like, oh, wow, I keep using this sort of um, a positive sentence structure where I just keep adding things on. That's not really working anymore. Uh, and now I'm going to try to do this thing instead or like just try to slowly turn yourself around so that you're always kind of growing as a writer. Yeah. Know your habits. I don't remember who I was. I think my undergrad professor was kind of a big proponent of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like that's figuring good. I don't out think who that's you really are. come up yeah. in that question. So, mm-hmm. yeah, everyone answers it I mean, differently. Especially for poetry, I guess. Like, you have to, like, figure out who you are and how you work. And, you know, it's, uh, I'm of, again, I'm of a mind that if every book I ever write is, like, completely different, mm-hmm. I would be happy. That's okay. Which is, flies in the face of a lot of what most poets kind of do, which is they want a very well defined a voice, um, which I respect that too. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but my goal is to kind of keep shifting, like to figure out what I'm doing and then not do that so much anymore and do maybe something new or different or the same thing, but turn it a little bit somehow. Uh, I, piece of advice for people. I mean, the biggest piece of advice with this is just to keep doing it, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm sure everybody says that. Yeah, just keep... That's really what separates people. Like, when I see... I have friends that, like, stop writing. They're very good writers. MFA program or PhD program or whatever, and then eventually stop. Mm -hmm. And you can always go back to it, but the longer you take off from it, the harder it's going to be to go back to it because you're going to be like, oh, I used to be so good, and now I'm not. Mm -hmm. Um... You have to, and it's not a very difficult thing to stay in practice for, you know? Yeah. Even if you're doing a poor job, you know that you're doing a poor job. You're doing a poor job at a better level than doing nothing um, at all. Yeah, describing it as a practice, mm-hmm. I think, is also helpful. Yeah, you really have to, like, keep doing it. I and mean, people stop doing it for all kinds of reasons. Yeah. I mean, um, I have a friend who I, I hope, a few friends who I hope returned to doing it, but they chose to have uh, kids and a family for a while, and I'm like, you know, this does not compare to that. <laughs> choose, yeah, choose that. But then they kind of stop doing it and they get full-time jobs. I have another friend who got like a tenure track job at community college and he's really grappling with like, he wants to write, but teaching something like five or six classes a semester, which is just insane. Yeah. Like, yeah. Especially at a community college. So Such a workload. 30 students per class times like six classes. It's 180 papers you got to grade every four weeks. Like, that's a, a just insane man um it really takes dedication uh to um dedication it takes practice yeah it mm-hmm. takes practice to be dedicated to like spending that time there i guess mm-hmm. yeah maybe that belief if you keep showing up yeah something might happen yeah. eventually yeah. yeah yeah that's good so what encouragement would you give to writers here in oklahoma and i'm kind of thinking Hmm. Maybe the students you teach or the young writers yeah. who are here who feel like they just need to go somewhere else if they really want to be oh, writers. I, yeah. Well, to be frank, it's hard to disagree with that. But, <laughs> <I know>. but, <laughs> um, but the, the, the God's honest truth is that we're kind of developing an art scene right now here. Mm-hmm. Um, and literally, we're in the midst of developing it yeah. kind of every year keeps getting a little bit different and bigger um, in a very positive way. Yeah. And and the, and the good thing with that is that if you want to, in a very Oklahoma way, mm-hmm. stake a claim for yourself, <laughs> it's yeah. like a really good place to do that because right. like um, the Oklahoma Book Fest is only five or six years old or something. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a, the, there's a scissor tail 
Creative Writing Festival that's not very old. All these things are relatively new. And you can really kind of like, if you wanted to start a journal, start a journal. Yeah. Like there's not that many in Oklahoma and we need all we, we can get, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I think like, and people are very open to uh, readings and stuff and events around here. Like people mm-hmm. are thirsty for it. Yeah. Um, and I would encourage anybody who's like a writer here to, you don't have to write about the place. I mean, that's good. I, I would like to see more like writing about Oklahoma, but I would encourage you to like find ways to stay tied, stay tied to the place at least a little, mm-hmm. you know, I keep thinking about that too. Like, I kind of want to start a journal or a press or something. Um, I just don't know how much time that will take. Quite a bit, I would imagine. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but you never know. Yeah, it's true. You never know. Yeah, I would say you stick around. Mm-hmm. Was there anything else you wanted to say about your current manuscript or any other works that you have in progress? You've already mm, not talked really. about yeah. that. I mean, well, yeah. I'm pretty. I'm pretty well. Hopefully, it'll come out sometime. And <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> We're looking for, for book two. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll add in that that, yeah. that note once we get this process. <laughs> um, there is a poem in here, mm-hmm. in this book, um, which is, yeah, a lesson while hiking Mount Skylight. Mm-hmm. It's from Maurice Kenny. Now I don't know if do you know who Maurice Kenny is. Mm-hmm. He was a, a Native American poet. He was mm-hmm. a Mohawk, um, and he lived in upstate New York. He taught at North Country Community College and at Potsdam University, soon at Potsdam. He won the American Book Award for Mama Poems, I believe. Um, He was the first poet I ever met. Oh, really? Yeah. And this was me running around the halls of North Country Community College when I was like five or six years old. Mm -hmm. And Maurice was this Mohawk dude, like long white hair and a ponytail. A very nice guy, an incredibly pleasant guy. Um, something about that, vivid memories of being like kind of in those old 1980s hallways mm-hmm. of that community college, my mom's office, you know, and running into Maurice and like talking to him. And my mom showing me his poems. I only added that up much later that that had always been kind of around. Yeah. Like it was kind of, you know, you're a kid and like you meet a, especially like a poor kid or whatever, and you meet a poet, it's like, hmm. I don't know, anybody did that. Like I didn't know that was real. Like, you, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I think I got lucky with people like that and like growing up in a kind of academic environment. You know, it's a community college. It's not quite the same thing. It's very small, but I got really lucky despite having grown up like kind of poorer, like maybe some of the students here. Mm-hmm. I got lucky that the right things happened at the right time that I kind of ended up moving toward, you know, wanting to be a writer yeah. um, and finding that I might be able to do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. The jury's still out. <laughs> well, we'll I think you've got, you've got a case yeah, got, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. uh, is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Mm, Maurice is a good one. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was great. I'm glad you mentioned um, that. I think also that he was Native American. I mean, my my father was born and raised in a Mohawk Indian reservation Mm -hmm. um, in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like part Native American, too. And I think that's part of, I don't know, there's something in there about that, too. Mm -hmm. That's something I've always wanted to grapple with is like where I I come from. My dad, uh, I don't know if this is even important at this point in the interview. (laughs) Uh, my, My parents split up and all that, but. My dad has like a number of siblings, possibly like seven sisters and like five brothers. Mm-hmm. But his mom was like a married a bunch of times, so he doesn't know any of them. Mm-hmm. So I never, I like a bunch of aunts and uncles that I just never met. And something about the association between like this Native American stuff and not knowing anything about sort of a huge branch of my family. <sighs> That's something I'm just, I keep grappling with, like to explore mm-hmm. that. And maybe it all goes, comes back to identity for me, yeah. and like with this and with that and a whole bunch of stuff. There's just all this kind of identity information that's missing. <laughs> or like, yeah, different or ways to, to see yeah. yourself. Okay. Yeah. So book three. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah. We got it. Got it um, yeah. No, yeah. I think that's it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Colin. Thank I you. Appreciate it. Yeah.